my name is uh, James Harris, and I'm a senior lecturer in modern European history at the University of Leeds. And it is my great privilege and honour to have the opportunity to talk today to uh, Professor Sheila Fitzpatrick, who is a Bernadotte Schmidt Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago, who is the author of, uh, among other books, A Commissary of Enlightenment, 1970, uh, the editor of Cultural Revolution in Russia, 1978, author of Education and Social Mobility, 1979. Perhaps many of you will, will know her best for uh, the textbook on uh, uh, early 20th century Russian history, The Russian Revolution, first published in uh, 1982, and since entering its third, uh, third. revision yeah. uh, uh, in 2007. The author of Stalin's Peasants in 1994, Everyday Stalinism in 1999, Tear Off the Masks, Identity and Imposture, uh, in 20th century Russia, 2005, uh, and innumerable other books and, and, and articles. Uh, uh, Professor Fitzpatrick has perhaps done more than any other uh, uh, historian to, uh, to shape the field of modern Russian history. And uh, perhaps most famously, she is uh, associated with, with revisionism, uh, with leading the challenge to, to what was then the dominant totalitarian model uh, in the 1970s. And I'd kind of like to focus our conversation on that transition in the field uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and the rise of, of, of revisionism. Um, could you, for us, characterize uh, the, the state of the field as you entered it, having completed your, your PhD? Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't come directly to America. I, oh, well, I, I suppose I did it after a few years, but what I can characterize are, will be American focused and it will be what I saw when I arrived, which I think was 72 or 73. And uh, I think now, looking back, that my perceptions of what was going on were not all that, were not completely accurate. But the way I understood it, uh, there was tremendous interest in studying the Soviet Union, and that was within a Cold War context. It was the enemy, and so therefore one wanted to know the enemy. The people studying it were mainly political scientists at that point, and uh, the, the model, as you said, that, that, uh, that they were working with, as I perceived it, uh, the dominant model was a totalitarian model, which was basically, which was based on a sense of similarity of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Now, when I arrived in America in the early 70s, I came, <clears throat> having been trained as a historian, and with the historian's sort of concern about, uh, about sources and, and archives, uh, and none of that, that was quite, that seemed quite foreign to, to the field as it was in America then, partly because it was hard to get there. To get to the Soviet Union to do research, you had to be, you had to be one of the relatively few people who went on a government exchange and then they didn't want to look into the archives and so on. Anyway, nevertheless, I wanted to do that kind of... I wanted to, to be a historian, which, which involved fairly extensive work with primary sources. And I also, I think, already wanted to do social history, although I was not doing social history. I was more on the sort of political cultural when I, at the time I arrived. So I perceive it, in short, as a, as a field dominated by political scientists, dominated by Cold War, and as I saw it, Cold War prejudices, which prevented a sort of objective uh, approach, uh, and also by political scientists. Can you, can you characterise in, in a few sentences, you know, what, what, what is the totalitarian model uh, in its essential essentials? Well, the notion of the totalitarian model is that uh, you, you have a system uh, of, 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 of total, where uh, you have a regime that aspires to total control over its citizens and has set up mechanisms which more or less uh, make, that, make that achievable. Uh, and, of course, there's also a value judgment put in there. This is, by definition, usually thought of as a bad regime. It's, one, it's, a, it's the opposite of democracy. Uh, and there are other characteristics uh, given in definitions of totalitarianism, but these were the, that, those would be the ones that I, in particular, reacted to. And my question, or uh, my doubt, always was uh, about the presumption that everything, every initiative, every, every change 
comes from the top and it's the result of a decision to produce that effect. I just was very doubtful that that can be so anywhere that you can have a society that is only the object of manipulation, that, that you, the, the leaders move it around the way they want mm -hmm. and, and, and it works. I, I didn't really, I didn't believe that in principle. And so I wanted to investigate what is it that's happening. Um, as we, we put, it, the, the term then was from below. In other words, we try and look at things from below uh, instead of simply from above. So is there an extent to which self-consciously that was the project of the, of the first book of Commissariat of Enlightenment? I don't think, well, I don't think that was the project of the first book, really. It was after, uh, the first book, what I was really interested in was the relationship between um, uh, Bolsheviks and intellectuals, and particularly the sort of mediating people, like my man Lunacharsky that I focused on. And I think I was also interested in, in what one was to make of the Bolshevik change claims to be concerned about popular enlightenment. That the Bolshevik claims that one of their aims was to enlighten the people. I thought, well, that's very different from what, uh, you know, what mainly people uh, uh, connect with, with the Bolshevik party and how does it indeed fit in. Uh, and so I was exploring that, and I, and I think there what I found, I, I mean, if one, in, in, uh, the sort of short version of what I thought I found, uh, was that indeed there was uh, a concern. Uh, in, enlightenment of the people was a, uh, was a real concern, that is spreading literacy and so on. Uh, but it wasn't a top priority concern. And that, that I, I interpreted mainly, I thought of priorities in terms of funding then. Uh, but it, it, I, I think one could take it further. So, so they had that commitment, but it was not at the top of the uh, list of their commitments. And the book itself was not particularly controversial when it emerged. It's, is it not your later, the later work? It's social mobility, education and social mobility. Yeah, no, a cultural revolution and education and social mobility were really where I got uh, into trouble. I, the Commissariat of Enlightenment, I think it was quite, you know, it did well. People liked it. People were interested to, to hear that there was all this stuff going on with the arts. But where I, I in my research, when I got to the Soviet Union, I did research, even some archival research, and that Commissariat of Enlightenment, which is really a Ministry of Education and Culture, I, I found myself working not only on its cultural side, but its educational side. And that led to the book Education and Social Mobility and some of the ideas that got me into trouble. Uh, and those ideas really had to do with the fact that uh, there, were, uh, there were affirmative action pro programs. Uh, the, the revolution is made on behalf of the working class. That, that's, that's the claim. So what's that going to mean? Uh, and one of the practical ways that they... In, uh, that they gave it meaning was uh, that the revolution uh, has allowed or is going to allow people from the working class to move upwards. And this was facilitated both by affirmative action programs on behalf of workers, they were also on behalf of small nationalities, but that, that's another, another question. Uh, and uh, these were introduced mainly at the end of the 1920s but at the same time was the period of the great industrialization push, which of course created many more manager a greater need for managerial and um, professional. Uh, the, the, those strata of society expanded, so naturally that produced upward mobility in and of itself. So that the effect was was multiplied. So I was talking about upward mobility and I said, well, you know, usually when people are upwardly mobile, uh, or often, uh, they think that whatever regime or system they live under facilitated that, as Americans obviously have always done. And that was very, a very unpopular line uh, in, in, in an American context to make about the Soviet Union, because I think there really is some feeling in America that you know, upward mobility is, is the thing that we, you know, that's our democratic thing. Did, did you, were you saying in that book that the regime, for that reason, was popular? 
Or was that something that... I was saying it was... No, I didn't. I, I think I may have been understood as making a bigger claim. But I was saying it was popular with the beneficiaries. I was saying that those people who came from the lower classes and after the revolution rose into the elites felt that the revolution had made that possible and, and had a certain a kind of loyalty. In other words, I was making an argument that uh, this... Uh, uh, this looks as if this is a regime surviving not only on fear, mm -hmm. but that on, there's some base of support, but it was support from the new elite that I was em emphasizing. I was not sure at that point whether there was any other support. And that, but that comes in my later books. So. To what extent did you anticipate the, the, the negative reaction? Were you, were you, did it take you by surprise? I was very surprised, yeah, because I thought social mobility, that is a universal social science concept that you can, um, you know, you apply it to America, you apply it to some other place. But I had no sense, I didn't understand America well at all, and I had no sense it was so charged for them. Uh, yeah, no, I, I was extremely surprised. But the, the totalitarian model uh, by this sort of mid to late 1970s has, has already been for, for, for quite some considerable time under an attack, a challenge. Can right. you tell us something about the sort of the the, the first wave of, of revisionism, uh, and, and and how it becomes the, the the second wave, how the second wave emerges, and 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 your place in it? That's a rather large question. Wow, well, how it becomes the second wave? I, uh, you know, that attack on the totalitarian model uh, by political scientists. There were there were various wings of it. Uh, there was Stephen Cohen. There was Jerry Huff. Uh, there were a bunch of people criticizing it in various ways and I I was just a sort of outlier on that because I was not a political scientist and my main point was I wanted to do social history which was in, implicitly kind of, it didn't fit with a totalitarian model, mm -hmm. that's why I couldn't work with a totalitarian model myself well because if I'm trying to study society and I think something happens within the society, that there are things that happen. Uh, I can't have a framework that says to me that things only happen because of initiatives from above. But insofar as I got into that argument, I think I uh, was didn't much know what I, I was talking about. So I don't really want to go there, particularly in that, that if if the focus is on me, to, to a degree I wasn't a, 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 a really informed participant in that discussion about theory. So there was, a, I suppose, what I'm what, what I'm suggesting is you, you, you there was a level on which you must have sympathised with those political scientists who challenged uh, the totalitarian model, but you perceived your task to be a very different. Oh, one. sure, sure, I sympathise with them. Yeah. But there, there surely is an extent by the time that your that second uh, and third books are attacked, that it sort of it must frame the way you, you, you see your work and your agenda. I mean, is there a level on which you are inevitably drawn in your work into the specific challenge, rather than the pursuit of archival research, into the specific challenge uh, of the totalitarian model? What, what did they accuse you of? Oh, well, the, yeah, the... The, the accusations were essentially trying to make the Soviet Union look good. Soft on communism, whitewashing the Soviet system by saying, for example, that, that there was upward mobility and that the regime had some kind of support other than terror. So that, that was the nature. And it was a very politicised sort of situation, actually, over in, in, in the United States at that time. So that there was a lot of jumpiness about the thought that somebody might be pro-Soviet. That was also puzzling to me because I didn't feel I was pro-Soviet. I mean, I suppose I could make that statement stronger. I, I, I wasn't pro-Soviet. I mean, it was, it, I was in no way like those people who uh, went over in the 30s looking for, you know, at the Soviet experiment and, 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 and saw something and thought, this is great. I, on the contrary, went as a graduate student in the late 60s over there, and I thought, my God, this place is backward. I, I mean, I was really struck at, at, you know, they make such huge claims for themselves, and nothing really works. And that fascinated me, the, 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 the contrast between the claims. But in any case, so I, I was puzzled by these pro-Soviet uh, uh, 
uh, accusation because I couldn't really fit them very yeah. well with me. I wasn't really one, uh, although I was, what I was read as was somebody um, who wants to say the Russians are people too, and, uh, and so on. I didn't care about saying the Russians are people too. Yes, of course they're people too, but I was interested actually in the peculiarities of the system. Uh, so how did that affect your research agenda from there, having completed education in social mobility? Where did you then proceed? Well, as I said, I, 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 with education and social mobility, I'd got where I thought I had shown uh, that, there, that there was a quite a solid body of social support in that group that I called the new elite, the, the, the people who come up from the working class in Soviet times and sometimes with the help of affirmative action. But then the question was, okay, was there any other support in the society? And I didn't know. I, 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 really, I really had an open mind about that. And that's partly why I did the peasant book, the book on collectivization, because it seemed reasonable. I actually thought when I went into that, very likely, the, the literature says the peasants all hated collectivization, mm -hmm. and it was done quite against their will, uh, purely by above, from above by Stalin for ideological reasons or whatever. So I thought the likeliest thing is some of them liked it and some of them didn't. Peasants? Peasants, yeah. I mean, that's usually the case, right? I mean, that, that some people want something and some people don't. So I thought that was probably the case. And I went, and all the more, because in the 1920s, there, there seemed to be, there clearly was a sort of pro-Soviet element in the peasantry. Uh, they, they gave it the name of the poor peasants, but it's a pe often people who served in the in in the war and in the civil war, and mm -hmm. they 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 joined the party at that time, or they became sympathetic with the revolution. They came come back to the village and they quarrel with the elders for who seem to have traditional wealth. So I thought that's there in the twenties. So logically speaking, mm -hmm. that's got to be a support for collectivization. So I then went in and researched it, and I couldn't find any support for collectivization. I mean, in other words, I. I felt that there, in contrast to my earlier work, where mm -hmm. I hadn't been looking for support but had found it, so now I'm looking for support and I don't find it, I find really a very general kind of resistance, active and passive, to collectivization, a perception that it is coming from above. Uh, and that's uh, so the focus shifted with Stalin's peasants to resistance. To, to the kinds of, not, oh, I was not dealing, unlike Lynn Viola, who wrote about active resistance, I wrote uh, mainly about passive resistance. Back so I'm, I'm writing about passive resistance, and I left the question, and I became very interested in the, uh, the dynamics within the, 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 the village, uh, which, uh, in the 1930s, which, which uh, were not, in, uh, which I, could not be put in terms of pro or anti-Soviet, uh, but I, I saw it as a very demoralized, as, as, as the communities as having become very demoralized and very malicious mm -hmm. towards each other, partly using the opportunities offered by the Soviet regime for mutual denunciation. Now there's that question about what happened to the support of the 20s, the, the apparent pro-Soviet uh, uh, support in the 20s, I never really addressed that, but Later on, I came back and I thought about it, and I, and I thought what it is, is that collectivization comes at the same time as industrialization, as the expansion of all kinds of job opportunities in the towns. Mm -hmm. Now, those pro-Soviet peasants were always kind of would-be urbanites to a degree. And so my sense now is that what happened in collectivization is that they all left. In other words, they're all very much in favor of the collective fund. They're just not going to stay and work on it. Uh, and that's why that sort of support so oddly, sort of crumbles and disappears. Disappears. And uh, the reception then of, of Stalin's peasants, it's, it's, the, the, the times are very much changing. Oh, that, that was, that was okay, the... yeah. That was, you know, the, where the Cold War affected, where one was uncomfortably affected by the politicization of whatever one wrote and the, where people did a lot of mudslinging and so on. This was the 70s and probably first half of the 80s, and then second half of the 80s, well, I was off in Texas at that point, and I wasn't really quite sure what was happening in second half of the 80s, but I was aware that as in that period, suddenly uh, people, I, I seem to have, have, have become a more acceptable figure uh, 
in the square, among scholars, among other scholars. And is that in part because uh, that your focus is changing to, to towards resistance? Is it also the, 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 the end of the Cold War? Is it about the... Uh, how do you explain that? The, yeah, I, do, I, I mean, I saw it... Aside from the fact that it was a very good book. Yeah. <laughs> well, I saw it in terms of the end of the Cold War, I think. But there's no doubt that of all the social social history approaches you could use, mm -hmm. the one that is least worrisome if people are worried about things being pro-Soviet is resistance. To interpret, to, to see resistance as a dominant process in the society, uh, it actually fits um, it, it fits a, a very critical take uh, on, mm -hmm. on, on the Soviet Union. Now whether I don't think that's why I went in that direction, but that is what you found in, in the... In anyway, the people know there's research. nobody bothered by you talking about resistance among peasants. Everybody uh, is quite happy with that notion. And then I went on uh, to do resistance. I mean, peasant, the peasant book was really part one of, of a social history of the 30s. And then I went on to do part two, and that was everyday Stalinism, and that was focused on everyday life, which, which also went out quite fine. I mean, everybody... That was a time when people, scholars, were interested in everyday life. I mean, they still are, but it was the beginning of that time of a focus on it. And I, what I was trying to do was to see how the sort of strategies with which people cope with a, a very difficult external environment. Mm -hmm. I was no longer in the questions of support. In, uh, I, I mean, I more or less put them to, uh, to one side, but I was interested in coping, coping strategies. So there's a great deal there about um, uh, about the techniques you develop uh, to survive in a society where all kinds of goods are very scarce, for example. Mm -hmm. And when then the in 1991 the Soviet Union collapses and the the archives opened, how did that was that a, a really sort of big uh, change in, in in what you could yeah. do and what you could imagine? Well, doing? It, was, it was wonderful. Actually, I mean, it was it, it was a totally incredible thing because I think nobody had predicted the collapse. However, people may say that they did, but they, they, they I think really didn't. So it was a big surprise to everybody. Now, what but what happened was that the um, the archives, at least the archives of the Communist Party, uh, became uh, open. We had had archival access before, but mainly to uh, on relatively safe sort of things like education mm -hmm. and coming out of the state archives and you know the party was the the, the party side was the uh, was the more important now with come 91 the very important secret police archives did not in general open although you got some if I remember out in uh, Sviatlovsky Katerin Wood but that was in this upheaval period uh, mm -hmm. and they didn't remain accessible to people for a long time, but nevertheless, the whole the thing is the archives open. You can suddenly go to the provinces. Before we were limited, you know, it was very hard to go to go anywhere except Moscow or Leningrad, wherever you'd been you'd been sent. Uh, so you can go out and work on um, uh, um, provincial archives. You can do oral history. All sorts of things that were just ruled out before became possible. And for me, that coincided with my moving to Chicago and getting all these great graduate students, of whom you were one, actually. Uh, uh, that was very, I hadn't had, really, graduate students in any number before. I mm -hmm. had had some in Texas, but I didn't think... Anyway, I hadn't had a, a, a lot. And so, moving to Chicago, having those graduate students with archives opening up all over... And you remember, I mean, people went to all sorts of places, distant places, different archives, so that the net result was of finding out very quickly, for me, much more of the new archival um, sort of treasure trove that I could have done on my own if it had just been me. Uh, so that was a great time for me. So you, but the, the, the whole, that, that social history of the 1930s was something that, that you had, had begun long before the, the archives opened. Oh, so right. So those two books surely sort of developed... Uh, on the basis of, of, of a lot of work that you had done before yeah. the archives opened. And, and 
Right, because as I said, some of, uh, I, I mean, I incorporated some of the new archives, but mainly that work, those works had been conceived before and on the basis of, of the kind of archival uh, material I could get access to then. Uh, in Stalin's peasants, in the case of Stalin's peasants, I found uh, that there was a great uh, body of material of letters that peasants had written to a peasant newspaper in the 1930s. Uh, and, uh, and that, yeah, Christianske Gazette. And so that was, a, I, I thought, a great source. Now, when the archives opened and the party archives were, you know, there was, of course, the possibility of going back and checking, you know, are you right, were you right, or were you not right? Uh, but in general, well, I thought, I, I didn't, that was not a big problem for me. Perhaps it would have been if I'd been talking about political history, but, but I mean, I basically, basically the party archives for my kind of stuff tended to provide uh, more, you know, confirmation. Now, in the case of, but no, perhaps a bit more than that, because the resistance theme, I'm trying to think of the sequence, Certainly the fact that archives opened, the classified ar archives in which you had reports of anti-Soviet feeling in the countryside, mm -hmm. that was, that became, I mean, they became accessible to me and that became a part of my story. But I think the resistance theme was already there. It's just that some more kinds of data came up. Right. And having then uh, come into the uh, into contact uh, as we all did with this amazing treasure trove of new documents and all that uh, your graduate students and others were were exploring in all sorts of, 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 of different ways in different places where do you where did you proceed where, where how did you decide where to, to go from this social history of the 1930s what what drew you well, yes. You know, then it was at that point, at the beginning of the... Towards the late 80s, I'd been dealing with social history and I'd been trying not to deal with class. I mean, you know, my sense was class was... A, I'd, I'd always... Class is the category the Marxists, the, the Soviets use, uh, and they use it in a static way and it's totally uninteresting and so avoid it if you can. That was mm -hmm. my attitude. But I, there's a sort of niggling worry about this. Uh, because after all, I did in my upward mobility stuff, I did draw on the concept of proletarian. Uh, and uh, even if I, if I said, well, it really means lower class. But in, in general, there was a problem about class and about social categories that I felt I'd been avoiding. Mm -hmm. Everyday Stalinism is very notable for avoiding any kind of social categories. You know, I don't talk about workers and white collar people. I just don't do that in that book. I write about strategies which urban citizens in general in get employed. Uh, but I, you know, this, there's a niggling worry about class because it, it, it never, it always seemed to me uh, to, it never described properly, uh, the, you know, what was actually in the society. At the same time, it was obviously terribly important, these class mm -hmm. terms that they're throwing around. So that's what I came to in the book that became Tear Off the Mask. I was thinking, well, okay, let's acknowledge that class is important and yet not adequately descriptive of things going on and work out what it's doing. And I got the sense of this, of the tremendous importance of class labeling and acquiring for yourself the right class label. In other words, in acquiring an identity uh, of, of, let's say, proletarian or poor peasant. And that identity is one that is actually, at, at, after a while, written in your passport, but it's also written in your identity, your earlier identity documents. It affects your whole, um, it affects whether you can, it, it, what category of rations you get, whether you can get into college, whether you can continue in, in, in high school, all these things, uh, whether you can, uh, can get an apartment. Uh, so the, the, the uses of class and the, and the ways in which people constructed identities for themselves which it enabled them to, uh, to prosper in this particular uh, uh, situation are what I turn to and tear off, off, off the masks. Um, do we want to get into post-revisionism? Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, so is that, that sort of cultural history, if we can, can we call it cultural history, tear yeah. off the masks? Well, 
in a yeah. political culture I, I suppose you can. Uh, it's focused on... Um, I mean, it's very much focused on behaviours, and that is like... Uh, uh, it, uh, that is like everyday Stalinism. They're both fo focused on people's behavior. Uh, everyday Stalinism is mainly about their behavior getting goods uh, and, and, and not getting into trouble. And uh, tear off the masks is about their behavior in, in, in constructing themselves and creating, uh, uh, creating good dossiers on themselves. Uh, uh, the this, this sort of construction of file selves was what I, I, I call that. But of course, there you're getting into identity. It, it was my particular way. Lots of people were doing identity studies at that point, and, uh, which I guess comes under cultural history. Uh, and I was doing it too, but in my own way, because I was, I, I, identity studies in general tend to be, studies of subjectivity tend to be a bit kind of amorphous for me. I like, mm -hmm. but so I was doing self-identification rather than, than a, a broader concept of, of, of identity, but it fits. But it was my sort of, uh, it, perhaps it was involved a reaction to the general turn in the field, which was towards cultural history, starting with the so-called linguistic turn. Uh, so no one was any more talking about the sort of uh, system from above and from below, is that, that, uh, that revisionist debate? Uh, was was carrying things in the 1970s and 80s. How had it changed by the 1990s and, and, and into this uh, uh, decade? Well, I think a lot of the revisionist, um, what had happened, two things had happened. One is the field did one of its, 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 its you know, the, the move, fields move. They'd been moved, they moved in the 60s, uh, 70s from political to social history. And then in the 90s, they start to move social uh, uh, social to, um, cultural. to cultural history. Uh, but in doing, and in doing that, it always involves quite a lot of, of, of formal repudiation or criti criticism of what's gone before. But there always is, too, a very large amount of absorption of what has gone before and just taking it for granted that that's how it is. I, I don't think now that you talk about people are not particularly interested in upward mobility, but they don't they, they don't deny it happened. Mm -hmm. It's just not what it's they're accepted. looking at. So that, so that's a, an example. But in one particular respect, the the people they start to call themselves post revisionists, but so maybe we can talk, call that term, use that uh, use that term, they in a way return to the question of support. The, the, which was the original revisionist question, social support for the regime, what social support was there. They returned to it, not looking at it in, in, in such specific ways as we did, but looking very much, uh, assuming, making the assumption, this starts with Stephen Kotkin and Magnetic Mountain, making the assumption, which is contrary to a, a lot of the, particularly the earlier, uh, not the Soviet, not the revisionist scholarship, but the early one, making the assumption that most people in most societies accept the situation they are in and, and try to learn the rules of it. And so in the Soviet Union too, uh, they are all, in Kotkin's terms, uh, all his people are, are trying to learn to speak Bolshevik. They're not running it's around thinking critically. They're trying to, they, they, they accept this worldview. It's the one that's around and, and they, they, they want to become more fluent in its expression. And that's being developed by uh, a number of, 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 of scholars of, of, of the younger generation. Uh, Jochen Helbeck, with Revolution on My Mind, uh, is, is, a, is a good example. So you, you had a younger uh, group of scholars focusing very much on the subjective experience of, uh, mm -hmm. what's, uh, in particular, of Stalinism. If, if I may be permitted to, to conclude uh, with a sort of a, a return uh, um, with a question about public perceptions of, of, of the Stalin period. Mm -hmm. For all that the profession has, uh, has developed uh, and gone through these stages decade by decade, there does seem to be an extraordinarily a sort of enduring sense uh, of public sense of the, of the regime in very much totalitarian terms, wouldn't you oh, say? Absolutely. How do yes, you explain now, that? It's very strange that the profession it was really strange how the profession accepts basically in my in my in my sense anyway, 
Uh, they accept uh, the, the revisionist stuff, but the public, the broader public, is, is virtually totally unaffected by it and continues to be interested in Stalinism the same way they're interested in Nazism. You know, it's it's the great the great evils uh, of, of, of uh, and and uh, uh, that that's uh, nothing that the revisionists did or that the post revisionists did have has changed that. And I, I'm not, sh I mean, exactly why that is, I don't know. I think the revisionists certainly did not accept, address themselves to the broad public, uh, probably feeling the broad public, especially in America, was not going to like mm -hmm. what they wrote. And, uh, you know, things were bad enough in Cold War terms within academia, let alone outside. But why, I, I mean, have you, got a, have you got a sense of why? I don't know how to explain the per per perpetuation of that. Well, it's it, it's always struck me that that uh, there is uh, a comfort in, in in the moral simplicity mm -hmm. of identifying the individual or that small group that is responsible for all the awful things that happen in that period, mm -hmm. and when you present explanations that that uh, identify sort of a, a, a much more diffuse. Uh, um, responsibility for you know what appear to be extraordinary crimes it becomes very complex morally complex difficult to to explain in in, in a compelling and simple way mm -hmm. it's very it's much harder to to present to the public and of course now we have also the russian the post-soviet russian contribution to this where, where i think in the russians have after all a big stake in uh, well, and, and they perceive it very strongly. Terrible things were done to us by them, and we're all us. Doesn't I, um, you know? Even if if if, if you happen to have held quite a high position, but that that sense of it was all done by us uh, us to them uh, is very strong. And and the, uh, I think our connection with the po in the post Soviet times, we have probably more connection than we did before with 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 Russian opinion. And, Absolutely. So there's there's probably something, uh, something there in that. A... But there probably is simply that, as you say, that people like history to be a morality play. Now that I always was very strongly against that. I came in with very much the, the feeling history shouldn't be a morality. That's not what a historian is meant to be do, doing, making moral judgments. I had that stronger than I would now have it. But it was just absolutely straightforward to me. Mm -hmm. that, that the historian's duty was to be as detached as, and, and, as, um, uh, and as objective as possible. That's the way I saw it in the 70s. Well, we, uh, we, we should, we, uh, I certainly look forward to, uh, to seeing uh, your next book, which I understand is on, on Stalin and his inner and circle. And his team, yeah. So we shall, we shall uh, do our best uh, to, to address the, 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 the broader public and, and, and bring them away yeah. from Now that. that is addressing the broader public, yeah. Can you tell us something about uh, your uh, training uh, in, in, in history from Melbourne and, and how you came to, to, to do your PhD in, in England? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well I actually come from a family of historians which meant that I didn't mean to be a historian. I, 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 at, at university level, I sort of aimed myself in very different directions, first of all music and then English. Uh, but somehow I ended up in history, and the reason I ended up in history was that we had a final, we had a fourth year honours essay uh, to do on the basis of original research. And I had done, I, Russian was a language I'd taken, and so I, uh, I thought, okay, I'll try and do it on a Russian subject. And that subject was Soviet music. And it was a question, have they, they, they say they want to make art accessible to the people, and uh, have they actually done this, succeeded in doing this in any, any way? So I found the process of, work, of, 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 of researching that and thinking about it absolutely fascinating. So I was totally hooked on that, uh, uh, on the, the business of, to me, doing history and reading history are, are incredibly different activities. And it was a doing that I really liked. So then, as was the, always the case pretty well in Australia in, at, at, at that point, in the in beginning 60s, uh, they, they always sent their people off, uh, to, to, preferably to Oxford or Cambridge, to get, to get finished. So off I go, 
full of uh, having received a very good and rigorous education in Melbourne, which emphasised primary sources and objectivity. And, uh, and uh, it was a very strong uh, message that one got there. So I go off to Oxford with these, you know, probably rather priggishly with all this sense of what it means to be a historian and thinking I'm going to, you know, there isn't really a history of the Soviet Union left, uh, yet written, so I'm going to start writing it. And I sort of assumed that, that Oxford, at Oxford I would uh, 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 learn, um, that, that I, I would learn, I, I thought, I assumed that, that what I got in Melbourne was a much lower level than what I would get at Oxford. That turned out to be disappointed uh, because, uh, uh, well, really, who knows why, but in any case, so what I acquired in that in the at, at Oxford uh, was uh, what I did at Oxford. Since you didn't actually get taught anything, I read the work on Sovietology, that mm -hmm. mainly American, and I I, I thought it was uh, at that time I you know very critical and thought it was pretty awful because I thought it's all politicized. This they they're not really trying to use a range of sources. There are many sources. They're not you know they. Okay, it's hard to get sources, but it, you don't have to use only Pravda and Stalin's collected works. You know, there is, is some other stuff out there. Uh, and so that's what happened to me in, 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 in Oxford that kept me on the, uh, in the field, keenly interested, uh, but already with a slightly challenging attitude towards um, the existing scholarship. And then when you expressed an interest in working and the Commissary of Enlightenment and working in, in, in Russian archives, what was the, the response of your, of your advisors at Oxford? Well, my advisor was a literary man. He was a translator. He, he, didn't, he was always terribly puzzled by the fact I kept talking about sources and, and so on. Well, he thought, fine, you know. Oh, yeah. Whatever she's talking about, you know, let her go off and do it. Um, and, and so there was no sense of criticism of doing it. I think people were quite interested in Lunacharsky and you know, interested in what I'd find out about him. So, right. yeah, do, do tell us about the experience of working in the archives in the, in archives. the, in the late 1960s. Right. Well, th this, this, is, uh, this leads on from the, from the Oxford story, really, because once I'd got to Oxford and found that actually there wasn't, as I saw it, a great deal for me to learn there, I, I became extremely keen on getting myself to the Soviet Union and getting hold of whatever materials I could get there. That was quite difficult for all sorts of reasons, because Australia had no official exchange and so on. So finally I get myself there. It took me about two years. And <clears throat> when there, now once I'm there, I think, well, you know, I, 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 I need to get access to archives. I'm working on this, this ministry, this commissariat, so I need access to archives. And I think I, there was a, a, a strong degree of innocence in this. I didn't realise that on the Soviet period you didn't get access to archives because I hadn't mixed with... Oxford didn't have historians who tried to do this, so I, I just didn't know it. And I was very uh, convinced of the rightness of my cause and so on, so I went around explaining to archive directors that I really need uh, access. And after a while, I think, and uh, I mean, there is the, the the famous. This this ends with the famous scene, which I, has, I suppose I've turned it into a story now, where I go to the archive director in Garth, who was the former Garth, and say, "Well, I have to have. I can't do this story without this." And he says, "No." And I was so frustrated, I started to cry. And he, at this point, I, I which I, I was very embarrassed by. But he then pats me on the shoulder, more or less, and, and in the way Soviets sometimes do, you know, decided, okay, I mean, the, the young girl, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what she writes, so he picks up the telephone and he says, you could give her some archives. And uh, anyway, so that was, that, that was my great trial. The beginning of a great career. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank mm -hmm. you very much.